All right, welcome to Digestive System, part two. Uh, anatomically, we are right here in the duodenum. So the stomach is done with the food. It is now what we call chyme, uh, largely undigested. And the first loop of the small intestine, intestine that that chyme is going to enter is called the duodenum. At this point in time, some other accessory organs like the pancreas, the liver, and the gallbladder get involved in digestion. So anatomically, we're going to stay right in the duodenum, and we'll talk about the small intestine, and then the liver, and the pancreas, and how all of that is regulated, and then we'll move on from there. Um, so anatomically, we are going to stay put for a few minutes. Uh, this is what you want to know first thing about the small intestine, where most of the nutrients and water are absorbed. When we get to the large intestine, you will see that water is absorbed in the large intestine. Not a lot else happens there, so you might be left with the impression that a lot of water is absorbed in the large intestine, and that's an important function of the large intestine. It's not. The large intestine is mainly there to store poo until you can find a toilet. I'm sure it does other things, but... Um, for this course, we are just going to think of it as largely as a storage unit. Um, don't worry for lecture about where it begins and ends. In lab, you will be identifying the pyloric sphincter and the ileocecal valve. Um, it is called the ileocecal valve, if you must know, because the bottom portion of your small intestine is the ileum, and this first pouch right here of your large intestine is called the cecum. So it's the ileocecal valve. Moving right along. Um, so there are three specialized structures that you find in the small intestine. As it says right there, circular folds, villi, and microvilli. What you need to know is that collectively they increase surface area of the intestine, as it says, for nutrient absorption. Um, so the circular folds are very big and visible with the naked eye. Uh, this down here is what they look like under the microscope. That would be low magnification, 4x objective, so they're really big. Uh, then if you zoom in, this is maybe 40x objective down here. You can, whoops, I didn't mean to go. Uh, you can see the villi. These are on a microscope slide almost pretty much visible with the naked eye if you hold it up to the light and look really carefully. Then the microvilli are really small microscopic structures, so small that they don't even show up very well with our microscopes. You need, as they have down here, an electron microscope to see them. Um, and so if you look, what we've done is this is one villus here. We've zoomed in on the surface of the villus. This is one epithelial cell, and you can see that the microvilli are hair-like extensions of the plasma membrane. So this area here inside of the microvilli, that's continuous with the cytoplasm. Embedded in the cell membrane of the microvilli are a whole group of enzymes called brush border enzymes. Somebody looked at this once and thought it looked like brush bristles or the bristles on a brush. So they called it the brush border and then the enzymes embedded in it got called brush border enzymes. So you want to think of the wall of the intestine as actually participating in digestion and absorption. So there are digestive enzymes and transport enzymes that do actual work and if you have more surface area, all this up and down and up and down and up and down, that gives you more room to implant more brush border enzymes. Intestinal juice. What do we want to know about the intestinal juice? Two important things to remember. One, not a lot of enzymes in it. Now, there are enzymes embedded in the intestinal wall, and we are going to see that there are enzymes that are secreted by the pancreas. The intestine itself does not dump enzymes into the intestinal juice. Uh, the other nice thing to recall is that its pH is about 7. So the chyme is somewhat acidic, definitely quite acidic, when it gets dumped into the duodenum. And the duodenum neutralizes the stomach acid, so throughout the rest of the small intestine, the pH is about 7. 
this is something you want to remember when you're doing the physio ex because it'll make sense of things for you um i do not think i have specific things you need to know about the duodenum in your objectives i don't so we'll skip this until such time as i remember to add it to the objectives uh, again so we're still going to stay right there where the arrow is um, and now talk about the liver, the pancreas, and the gallbladder. First stop, the liver. Um, I don't love the pictures that we have with the liver, but they're what we have. Um, you will see when you look at the liver under the microscope that it looks kind of like that. It's got a very geographical pattern to it or geometrical pattern. So here to borrow a slide from lab, is what the liver looks like under the microscope. This is probably with your 10x objective. So one of these things right here is called a lobule. And what happens is blood gets dumped into the lobule at the corners here, like these places. Um, and then it flows through all of these little channels called sinusoids and ends up here in the central vein. I always forgot, almost forgot the name of it. Um, so same thing here, right? Blood is coming in here from your hepatic portal vein, which we haven't talked about yet. But this is blood from your digestive tract. Um, and it flows through the sinusoids. Um, and as it flows through the sinusoids, if you look here, Right, it's passing all of the hepatocytes. So these here, those are all your hepatocytes. They do the nutrient processing, um, vitamin storage, cholesterol regulation. They do all of the chemistry that the liver is known for doing. And then along the way, some hepatic macrophages, which um, our book is still calling cup for cells there. They physically cleanse the blood so they can clear out dead red blood cells too. So by the time that blood that started from here ends up in the central vein, the nutrients have been processed and it has been physically clarified. Um, for lecture, we just want to be familiar with this list of things that hepatocytes do. So we are primarily going to think of it as producing bile because that's the big thing that it does for the digestive system um, for us as far as we're concerned. But it also does, if you look at the first and third uh, bullet point there, processing bloodborne nutrients has to do with um, like detoxifying alcohol, processing cholesterol and fats, and then preparing foreign material for secretion. This is what a lot of people mean when they say the liver detoxifies your bloodstream. So it is not a filter in the way that a Brita filter is a filter that physically pulls um, impurities out of the water. What your liver does is add, I think they're either ethyl or methyl groups, it doesn't matter, but it puts little chemical tags on things that come from outside the body, non-endogenous um, chemicals, which then makes it easier for the kidneys to excrete them. Um, so the, the two organs kind of work together. And I think the word detoxification gets used way too much by people that are trying to separate you from your money by selling you dietary supplements that you don't need. So if anybody ever tries to sell you anything because it's a detox, save your money, just eat natural foods, drink water, and you'll be fine. But not bottled water. I'll stop. All right, what's next? Bile. This, I believe, is an essay question. Um, you want to know what's in bile. You need to be able to describe it. So it's just bile salts, cholesterol, and bilirubin. Um, bile salts are responsible, as it is highlighted there, for the emulsification of fats. When we go over the digestion of fats, we'll talk more about what emulsification means. For now, just think emulsification is mixing. And what you're really doing is mixing the fat with the water. Um, like 
salad dressing that you make at home with just vinegar and oil. You shake it up, it separates really quickly. The stuff that you buy at the store might not separate at all or might separate very slowly because it has emulsifying agents in it that allow the water and the oil to mix a little better or a lot better in some cases. Uh, the gallbladder stores and concentrates bile. That's all we need to know. So the pancreas, uh, we covered the pancreas once already and we talked about the islets, but when we covered the islets, we didn't say you needed to be able to differentiate between the islets and the acenar cells. Now you do. This is going to be more of a lab thing, but I reinforce it in lecture. Um, so this picture here is 10x objective pancreas. And then the one over here is probably maybe 40x objective pancreas. Uh, and this like light group of cells here and that light group there and this light group and that light group, those are the islets. That is where the insulin and the glucagon come from. Everything else, all of these cells, all this darker purple stuff, those are all the acenar cells, and that is where pancreatic enzymes come from. So these are, as it says here, exocrine. So they are going to secrete enzymes, which are going to end up in your digestive tract. And the lumen of your digestive, digestive tract is considered to be part of the outside world that has been internalized in your body. So it is not one of your bodily compartments. So this is an exocrine function. Um, and I think that's all we need to know. Acenar cells are responsible for secreting the enzyme-rich pancreatic juice. Um, and I should say it's actually two different cell populations, um, so maybe I misspoke just a little. Um, so these cells right here, the acini, that is where the enzymes come from. And then these duct cells here and there, they actually produce the juice. So you have two different cell populations, one that churns out a lot of enzymes and another that churns out a lot of liquid. And later you'll understand why that's important. Um, what do you want to know about what's in the pancreatic juice? Here's where um, the, the enzymes from the small intestine come from, or the enzymes that work in the small intestine come from. Um, so there's bicarbonate in the juice, that's to neutralize the stomach acid our friend, the bicarbonate ion, and then amylase to digest starches, lipase for lipids, nucleases for nucleic acids. So you're going to have ribonucleases and deoxyribonucleases. Then proteases are a little bit more complicated for two reasons. Uh, one, proteins are complicated molecules, and you have some proteases that can work on the carboxy end, some proteases that uh, can munch on proteins from the amino end, and then some proteases that can cut them right in the middle. Um, so you have different kinds of enzymes, and they're all stored in an inactive form. So they're called proenzymes. So what you need to know from this slide is that these are the three proenzyme inactive proteases. They're stored in an inactive form because if you had a bunch of enzymes that could chew up proteins and you stuffed them in a vesicle waiting to secrete them, they would digest each other because they're proteins that digest other proteins. So they have to be stored in a form such that they are inactive and then when they get released they become active again. So it's just like the pepsin which I forgot we'd already covered. Um, so these are the proenzymes. These are the active forms of the enzymes. And the enzyme that activates all of the enzymes is a brush border enzyme called enteropeptidase. So you need to be able to recognize the proenzyme and active enzyme form of these three enzymes and then know that is enteropeptidase which is supposed to be represented by the saw that activates them all. And that is um, embedded in the cell membrane of the intestinal epithelium or the brush border. All right, so now we have got 
chyme has entered the duodenum, you are going to need pancreatic enzymes with the juice that they're contained in, bile from the gallbladder, and you're going to want to start making more bile to replace the bile that the gallbladder is about to squirt in the duodenum. So the next couple of slides go over how each of those things happens. Um, the first actually starts before you even eat. So during the, I don't know if it says it, um, it's actually, let's just say before you eat, don't worry about which phase of stomach secretion we're in. Um, but before you eat, your brain knows that you're going to eat. Your vagus nerve tells your gallbladder, oh, here we are, gallbladder, to squirt a little bile into the duodenum. Most of that bile stays in your small intestine and ends up in your large intestine. Some of that bile makes its way back into the bloodstream and then back to the liver. And when the liver gets hit with it, gets hit with its own bile, that's going to cause it to make more bile later on. So this is kind of a time delay mechanism here. You secrete a little bile before you eat, and then a couple of hours later, that bile is going to make its way back to the liver. So that's the first thing that you want to know, or the first mechanism. Then when the chyme hits the duodenum, two different enzymes get released. CCK is the blue dots over there, and secretin is the stars. Um, I think we already talked about CCK in regards to the stomach. It is cholecystokinin. You will never have to spell cholecystokinin. Um, so now, right, you've got, let me go back and get, right, secretin stars, CCK circles are released into the duodenum, excuse me, released by the duodenum, and they just float around in the peritoneal cavity. When the secretin hits the pancreas, it causes the pancreas to secrete juice. When the CCK hits the pancreas, it causes the acenar cells to make the enzymes. Then... Some of the bile that was squirted there earlier and the secretin are going to make it to the liver and cause the liver to start making more bile. And then when the CCK, there should be a blue dot here, um, hits the gallbladder here, that causes the gallbladder to release more bile. Um, so basically know these four bullet points right here. But that's how your body ensures that bile and digestive enzymes end up in the duodenum when the food hit, hits it, and how you begin to re start replacing your bile right after it's been squirted. All right, now we are on to the large intestine, which we said propels and stores feces. And that's all we're going to talk about for it. Again, there is some vitamin and water reclamation that takes place there, but not a lot. Um, probably like the, mo the biggest impact that your large intestine has on your body does not come from the large intestine itself, but it comes from the bacteria that live there. Um, so what, where does it say here? Fermenting indigestible carbohydrates. This is breaking down fiber a little bit and the irritating acids and gases, that is flatulence. So that is where flatulence comes from. And I haven't added anything to this slide to talk about the effect of bacteria on health and homeostasis. But the more scientists look, the more they're finding that um, gut health or your gut microbiome has a big effect on your overall health and well-being. Um, even like some studies in, in mice have found that it can affect your levels of depression and anxiety too. I don't know if that holds true for humans, um, but the more we look, the more we're finding. Uh, also, I will just throw out this other warning here. Um, as far as I know, nobody has figured out the best way to recolonize your gut if your gut bacteria are out of balance. So if somebody is selling you a probiotic pill or anything that just says probiotic anything, save your money. Um, probably the best thing you can do to promote yeah, the proper 
microbacterial or microbiome growth in your gut is to just eat natural foods. If you want to accelerate the process, you can eat some fermented foods like yogurt and kimchi um, that have microorganisms in them that ferment things. Uh, but for the most part, if you give your body the kinds of foods that our bodies were always meant to eat and process, naturally occurring foods, then the natural bacterial flora that is supposed to live there will be supported by the natural foods. Um, I know this sounds like a Whole Foods commercial. Um, you don't have to spend a ton on organic everything. Um, just, you know, buy processed, buy foods that are processed to the least degree possible. Read a book by Michael Pollan called In Defense of Food, if you want a good read on healthy eating. He makes it relatively simple. Moving right along. Um, oh, we're, geez, we're just about at the end. This is great. Um, so this is your other open-ended question. Um, and there's actually quite a lot of information embedded in the next, I think it is four slides, um, you can expect to get one or two of these, most likely one, um, as a question on the exam, but I won't ask you which one. So for any of the macronutrients, you want to be able to describe what happens to it in the mouth, what enzymes act on it, if any, what happens to it in the stomach, what enzyme act, acts on it, if any, um, and then what happens to it in the small intestine? How does digestion proceed in the small intestine? And then what is the final breakdown product? And does that nutrient now end up in the bloodstream or the lymph? So you need to be able to cover those four bullet points for any of the major macronutrient groups. So we're starting with carbohydrates. They are going to get chewed in the mouth, everything is going to get chewed in, chewed in the mouth and churned in the stomach. That's just a given. Then enzymatic digestion of starches begin with salivary amylase. Then in the stomach, they just get churned. Then in the small intestine, pancreatic amylase is going to take long polysaccharides and break them up into short oligosaccharides. Um, so oligo anywhere between 2 and 10, let's say. Um, individual sugars all linked together. Then your brush border enzymes are going to take the oligosaccharides and break them up into individual monosaccharides that are going to end up in the bloodstream. What you want to be able to type on the exam is what I have typed over here in the PowerPoint. Don't worry about individual examples of disaccharides and monosaccharides. Too much detail. All right, then we're on to proteins. So as it says here, they get just get chewed in the mouth, they get churned in the stomach, but now you have pepsin. Um, so the pepsin is going to begin the enzymatic digestion of proteins in the stomach. Um, you can also list the stomach acid, but I forgot to, so it's not on there. Then you get to the small intestine. In the small intestine, you are going to have your pancreatic proteases, remember those three, you don't have to write them all, just write proteases. They take large polypeptides and break them up into short oligopeptides. And then the brush border enzymes take the short oligopeptides and break them down into individual amino acids, which are then absorbed into the bloodstream. For lipids, um, chewed in the mouth, salivary amylase churned in the stomach, in the small intestine, it is going to be, so then I should say, now you have to add bile salts as an assisting molecule that emulsify the fats. And then the enzyme is going to be pancreatic lipase, um, which breaks down the fats. And then those fats that are digested into things that are small enough to be soluble in the bloodstream enter the bloodstream undigested lipids or partially digested lipids enter the lymph. Um, so now we will take just one minute to talk about 
what I mean by emulsification. So this big blob of E's is supposed to be a bunch of triglycerides. So you remember um, a fat, a dietary fat or lipid that is not cholesterol starts off as a glycerol head group that's supposed to be three carbons um, with then three fatty acid tails coming off of it. So it'll look something like that with oxygens and hydrogens and everything. So each one of those E's is supposed to be a triglyceride. Here you have a big blob of fat, so a big blob of triglycerides. These little Pac-Man looking things are the lipase molecules that are trying to break up your triglycerides into glycerol head groups and smaller fatty acid or hydrocarbon tails, but they don't have a lot of surface area to work with. So the triglycerides that are near the surface are accessible to the lipase, but the triglycerides hiding in the middle aren't going to be digested until that glob gets smaller. If you break the glob up into smaller fat droplets, then you have greater surface area to volume ratio or more surface area. There's less room inside of each of these droplets for fat to hide from the lipase and it makes it easier for the lipase to digest the fat. You will notice that I still have all intact E's here. So emulsification does not break any covalent bonds. It is not an enzyme. It doesn't digest or break up the fat molecules. It just mixes the fat molecules with the water. But it, it really helps that way. So it's very similar to, um, I can't speak, the uh, surfactant in the lungs that help form a bridge between air and water. Here it's fat and water. All right, now we are on to nucleic acids. These are a little simpler. Um, so they get chewed in the mouth, churned in the stomach, in the small intestine. There are going to be pancreatic nucleases. Don't worry about ribonuclease and deoxyribonuclease. You can just say nucleases that turn large polynucleotides, big pieces of DNA and RNA, into oligonucleotides, short pieces of RNA and DNA, um, all the way down to individual nucleotides. And then the brush border enzymes break up the nucleotides into their phosphate and their sugar and their bases. So if you remember DNA and RNA, is a phosphate sugar backbone that is holding all of these nitrogen bases in a certain arrangement. The brush border enzymes break up each of the nucleotide into its different parts. Then um, water absorption, I don't know why this gets stuck at the end, but it does. Um, so as things are being digested, if I go back here, right, they're also being absorbed. Here I have fat being absorbed, which is not a good example, but imagine this was all sugar and salt and proteins, right? As you're moving all of the solutes out of the lumen, you're leaving behind all the water. You're creating an osmotic gradient, right? If all the nutrients are going in here, then there's higher concentration of water out here than in here and the water just follows by osmosis. So because most of the digestion and absorption of uh, solutes, nutrients, takes place in the small intestine, most of the water also follows. So they're always going to be coupled together that way. Um, and we should remember that when we get to the urinary system because your kidneys are responsible for regulating a lot of water movement and they do so by regulating a lot of solute movement. All right, that's it. That's the digestive system. Thanks for sticking around this long.